Good evening. It's a great turnout. It's great to be here. Um, I'm really most excited to be here uh, talking with Dr. Pagano since he's one of my mentors, even though he doesn't know that. Um, but all of his books and all of his uh, work has been really important to me, so I'm really glad to be here with him. And um, I'm really glad to be here and um, in the medical school again. It's been a long time. So um, what I'm hoping is that everything we'll talk about will be stuff you've already heard about in medical school, and you'll tell me how much medical schools change, and I'll be really excited about that. So we'll see. But um, Dr. Prisoner and I decided that we would talk about the gut um, from an integrated perspective uh, and sort of hope to make this more of a dialogue between the two of us and between all of you in terms of how to look at the gut um, from maybe a, maybe a little different way than you've been taught. I'm not sure. We'll find out. Since it's been 20 years since I was a first year medical student, I'm not sure what's happening there. Oh, I feel old. Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to start just by using actually um, celiac disease as our model, which I'm sure all of you have studied about or heard about in school. Um, and celiac disease is actually one of my favorite uh, GI disorders to use as a model to when discussing integrative approaches to the gut because it's a well-established condition in mainstream medicine that really, I think, proves um, a lot about gut integrity and how the immune system works through the gut without, uh, not that I was taught it that way in medical school, but I think that, that it's a really great model and I think it's a good way to understand um, gut integrity through a model you may already understand better. So um, celiac is um, a, a complex interplay of genetics, environment, and immune dysregulation. So um, having the genetic predisposition to celiac is important, but then you need environmental triggers, and those together, maybe not just those, cause immune, uh, continued immune dysregulation that then causes the manifestations of celiac. When I say celiac and the manifestations of celiac, does everyone know what I'm talking about, or yeah? Okay, just stop me if you go. Um, we're not gonna, don't worry, this slide looks horrible. There's a lot of horrible looking slides here, but we're not gonna worry about that. I'm just using it as an example. So the genetics of celiac are that, um, it's very rare to have celiac without having a certain genetic phenotype of HLA um, molecules. So that what that means is that most, 95% actually of people with celiac have an ex expression of, well not expression, carry HLA D2, it's called genes. It's not important to remember that. Oh, and then the other 5% have um, Q2. Why am I forgetting? Q8, thank you. Um, and the importance of that is that that is your genetic predisposition, but actually a large amount of the population, up to 30 to 40% of people don't have celiac but carry this phenotype. So it's a question of who expresses it and who doesn't. And the way it works, that the, what this diagram is just showing you is an interesting way to look at how the proteins of gluten, <coughs> which are mostly what are called proline and glutamine, get actually negatively charged and become presenters to this HLA gene, which then causes the immune system cascade, in a nutshell. But you need the gluten to do that, right? You need gluten to make that happen. But the question is, um, you know, how is it that you can have gluten, let's say you eat gluten in your first couple of years of life and you're diagnosed with celiac, but let's say there's adults who have been eating gluten their whole life and they don't and they don't get diagnosed. That's where the conundrum is, right? What's the difference? But you definitely need that environmental trigger, the genetic um, express, the genetic predisposition, and then together, those supposedly those cause the immune dysregulation. But what um, we're going to talk about more today is, you know, what's the missing link in all that as well. So. Um, the human microbiome and the trillion of bacteria, right, that live in our gut are actually um, part of that missing link, we think, and a really interesting, complex part of that missing link. So if anyone, if anyone here is familiar with um, Dr. Fasano, who's an amazing physician who's done uh, groundbreaking work in this area, and Dr. Fasano is going to talk more about some of his work at, um, when he talks. I love the way, I don't know if you've heard him describe this, that he describes that um, thinking about the genetic code, each person's 
genetic code as a piano, but the bacteria as the piano player. So that um, thinking about it, that there may be genes in there that could be triggered, but you don't have to hit all of them all the time, right? You're not hitting all those keys. And what's really important is who's sitting at the piano playing. And so which bacteria are there and what's getting hit? That's where the real key is. And so when you think about it that way, it's a really fascinating way to think about how someone can be 60 and diagnosed with celiac and not have had problems before and maybe have problems later. And maybe that bacteria population is changing um, due to infection, antibiotic, surgery, a host of, a host of factors. And actually, you know, um, from my perspective, um, and mo I think most people who would say they practice from an integrative perspective, um, from my perspective, there's a tons of reasons why we could have increasing um, diagnoses and increasing um, onset of celiac or other similar diseases. Um, there's a host of new chemicals we're exposed to, a host of new pollutants, bio biochemically engineered foods, and an increasingly nutrient-poor um, diet that's poor in the probiotics and prebiotics that we need for our gut to, to be healthy. So it's a really fascinating um, realm of what's going on in the gut, this, this realm of research, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as we go along. These are, don't worry, I'm not gonna go over all these. Um, but this is just a tight junction in the gut, so it's just it's interesting to look back and see what we're talking about. So we're talking about these junctions where proteins can go through. And when we think about that, um, we know now uh, from work in celiac that this zonulin is really important, that upregulation of zonulin and that peptide can cause dysfunction in that tight junction. So we think about that a lot now with um, the gut and celiac and other disease. Now celiac's um, connected to lots of extra intestinal manifestations, right? So you hear about increased incidence of diabetes, autoimmune thyroiditis, um, rashes like dermatitis or pediformis, um, arthritis, depression, cognitive changes. That's why I love celiac as an example because we have this example in medicine where someone has something going on in the gut but it causes all these other problems. And so I use that a lot to explain to patients in my clinic how maybe who don't have celiac but maybe have something going on because of a certain food and explaining to them that that food can actually be causing the joint pain you're having in your knee or um, so on. So when we look at, um, when we look at, this is a um, diagram that's looking at um, diabetes in the same, that's related to celiac. And I just used it as a way to show how um, diet can be influential. So you can have a, a diet that's gluten free and you have a change in the bacteria that's in your gut or you can have um, gluten in your diet and then that bacteria can go up. I'm gonna simplify this, really simplify this, but um, what you're causing is this upregulation of zonulin that we talked about, that's causing disruption in this integrity, and then you're getting these antigens and proteins going across and causing immune response, because we know that, right, 70% of our T cells are sitting there waiting to have a cascade right there in your gut. Um, we have talked about just maybe mentioning about diagnosis for celiac. You really need biopsy for diagnosis, but I wanted to point this out because we use tissue transglutaminase a lot. It's actually the best serologic test for celiac, but it's good to understand why it is. So it's an enzyme that actually takes gluten proteins and does that negative charge so that it's more easily presented to that HLA gene. So that's why we look for it, and it's good to just know if you're doing a lab what you're testing it for. So this is that same diagram, but I actually think gut integrity should have been, and I'm not very good at doing that, it's the best I can do. I liked it actually, I thought it was pretty good. So um, I think gut integrity should be part of this circle, um, and hopefully they'll, they'll change that and make that part of it. Um, we're not really getting into it tonight, but we could talk about it more in the dialogue about how we replenish gut integrity. It's a kind of a whole nother talk. But we, um, when we're talking about celiac, we're talking about removing the offending foods. For other disorders, we might just do an elimination diet to look for what that food is. We want to replace missing enzymes. Um, so there's villus atrophy in the gut, and enzymes along those villi are disrupted. You might want to um, replace those. You want to think about restoring a favorable bacterial community. And we, that's where it gets hard. It's hard to know exactly what the right probiotic is and the right dose, but that's what's being worked on. And you want to replenish that gut lining that was 
disrupted with different micronutrients and anti-inflammatory supplements. And never forget stress management because stress actually disrupts that gut integrity as well. So that's just an intro to what we're going to talk about. And Dr. Brazorn, do you want to start talking about food a little? We can go back and forth. Are there questions on that before we go on, actually? Yeah. Can you just define gut integrity? Yeah. I'm a med student, so yeah. maybe it hasn't changed that much. Maybe it hasn't. Maybe school changed. hasn't changed enough. <laughs> I know, do you talk about leaky gut? Or? We haven't done GI yet. Okay, okay. Um, so gut integrity is a healthy gut lining that allows, that does not allow an overflow of those food proteins to go across. So gluten, in this case we're talking about celiac, gluten would go through those, just a small amount would go through those tight junctions, but in celiac that border, that lining is so disrupted that you have so much room that just goes through like this. So gut integrity is keeping that lining in integrity there. Does that make sense? Um, no, gluten is never fully digested, that's the thing, so there's always some protein to react. <coughs> Well, thank you, Dr. Sethi. That was an excellent presentation of the uh, conventional understanding of uh, uh, severe gluten intolerance, we also call celiac disease. So before I start, though, I want to just do a little um, couple of kind of overview thoughts. So I used to work here way back when I was a student at Bath Medical School 42 years ago. Um, <laughs> I worked my way through to Bath Medical School by being a research associate here at the University of Washington School of Medicine. So uh, actually, um, I thought way back in 1970 that my pathway in life was to become a researcher, a medical researcher, and I just loved doing research. And so I was working at the Department of Rheumatology uh, in the School of Medicine, just a few blocks down. None of these buildings were here at that time. Um, I was you know, just <coughs> loving doing research on art, trying to find a cure for arthritis. And then the woman who married my roommate from college, who had suffered from juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, was cured for arthritis. So wait a minute, this incurable disease. How can you, how can you get, get cured? She said, Why don't you make a doctor? I said, Well, what's that? I, mean, I thought there was only medical doctors. I didn't even, didn't even know there were chiropractic doctors, let alone naked doctors. So I said, So well, that's interesting. So I went to this guy and I said, Well, what did you do for my friend? He said, Well, I detoxed by her liver and taught her how to eat. I think, What's your liver have to do with her, with her hands and her knees being swollen? And said, then I said, Well, can I spend a few days with you watching when you see patients? And I saw, quote, miracle case after miracle case of patients who were medical failures being cured by this guy. Now I'm going to be real clear. I'm not anti-conventional medicine. Conventional medicine doesn't do some miraculous <coughs> things. But there's some things medicine doesn't do very well. And that's kind of much the idea of promotion of health. And this guy was really good at it. So I saw these patients <coughs> being cured that were, quote, incurable. And that got me to become the exact doctor. So um, I look at you with uh, a lot of fondness. and. Um, and also very happy that this is happening here at the University of Washington. Because 40 years ago, there was no way that someone like me or someone like Dr. Sethi would be here talking about the role of uh, food and health. My, I remember having arguments with the MDPAC I was working with, where I talked about how food had a huge impact on a person's health. He looked at me and said, food has no impact on people's health whatsoever. You're wasting your time. <laughs> and yeah, that, that was a medical doctor 40 years ago. OK, so let's get into, into today. So here's the challenge. So um, now I now have lots of years of practice, and um, early on in my practice, when I've seen patients who have chronic disease, I found that the vast majority of them stopped having their chronic disease, but got a lot better. But I haven't recognized what foods they were reacting to. At first, I thought it was food allergy, but later I became realized that it consider the concept of food intolerance, and almost all of them was weak. Now it almost took over my practice, and that is I found with my patients. With all these diseases, if I have stopped being weak, it all got better. And what was frustrating was that I was taught, just like Dr. Sethi said, you know, you see like disease, immunological reaction, very severe, uh, but only half a percent of the population. Now I would say <coughs> probably more than that. Conventional textbooks have typically said about half a percent. Do you know what, what they're saying now with the percentage? Up to one percent, but really, really low. That would seem virtually everybody. And so I started to realize it was not it was probably not immunological. So I think, okay, something else was going on than just simply an immune reaction to weight. So anyway, so um, that was interesting. And anyway, it got me um, 
uh, walking down this pathway. And uh, as uh, Dr. Sethi said, Dr. Fasano uh, research was brilliant to figure this out. So I'm going to do is real quickly cover the weak conundrum, the Johnny discovery, Gliadin, disease association, prevention, symptom reduction, and recommendations. Okay, so um, it's very clear if you look at the history of modern civilization, without wheat, we probably would not have evolved at the edge of the species. Wheat is a very inexpensive way of giving people a lot of calories and also getting a lot of food. So wheat's really, really important. When we start looking at um, disease associations with the amount of wheat consumed by any particular co country, you find a lot of wheat strong correlation. The more wheat they consume, the more chronic disease they have. Now there's other compounding factors, of course. We know the Western diet is terrible, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, you know, how, how come this is, seems like such good food yet we see so much correlation with disease, and my personal experience was just dramatic. Stop eating wheat, get dramatically healthy. Then Dr. Pistol came along. Now he was actually not researching wheat. Uh, he was researching infectious disease. In particular, uh, he was looking at what molecules be secreted by the gastro gastrointestinal mucosa when it comes to contact with invas invasive organisms such as cholera. And as you know, a person with cholera, they got a lot of food washed into the gut to wash, wash the cholera. Uh, uh, Watch the uh, cholera toxin out. And he discovered that the chemical released by the gut to open up the pores and wash out all the water was zymine. And so he was very excited about this research. But then he actually found out that zymine is released not just by the cholera toxin, but it's also released by gliadin, uh, one of the subproteins in wheat. And there he begins the search. The, the, the pathway. So here we have the gut uh, mucosa. <coughs> Here what are called the tight junctions. Now, when I was in school a long time ago, we were told that the gut and mucosa was totally intact, nothing leaked from the uh, gut into the blood. Well, look at more research so about 30 years ago. Researchers now show that actually about 1% of the protein ingested is absorbed into the body undigested. So what's going on here? What's going on here is that the body is intentionally open up the space between the cells to sample what's in the gut to determine if the body is to react to something. Okay, so the body tells you at what's in the gut. No problem. But what happens if that opening, which happens only for a very short period of time, gets out of the control of the body and starts being open all the time? So that's what happens. With zonulin, whenever anybody eats wheat, the gliadin infection of the wheat actually causes zonulin to be released, and zonulin causes the gut to open up. So not only now is the gut being open for sampling, but now the gut is being open without control, so whatever's in the gut is now leaking into the body. And leaking of stuff into the body is resulting not only in antibody uh, reaction to those intact uh, uh, polypeptides and proteins and you know, poly polysaccharides, et cetera, you're also getting upper regulation of inflammation. So even if there's not an inflammatory, uh, immunological reaction, there is an inflammatory reaction. So there's a direct correlation between the amount of wheat consumed and in people who produce zonulin, which not everybody, I'll get that story in a second. But basically, the more wheat they, more wheat they, they consume, and the more zonulin they release, the more they chronic the upper leg inflammation, that means inflammation all throughout the body. And that's where we start getting pretty interesting. So now the question then is, well, who, who, who has zonulin who doesn't? Turns out zonulin is a precursor for haptoglobin 2. Now you may know from your biochemistry and your basic, your basic bio, uh, physiology that we have basically two kinds of haptoglobin in the body. Haptoglobin 1, haptoglobin 2. Haptoglobin's <coughs> purpose in the body is to bind to iron. So anytime you get damaged and you get blood vessel leak, some iron, some iron gets released. And iron is extremely <coughs> oxidative. You know, iron is very, very oxidative in the body. Um, you can look at um, Alzheimer's disease and more iron in a person's brain, the more Alzheimer's disease they have, and it's really strong oxidizer. So the body um, puts a lot of energy into uh, it, it getting rid of this iron that's so released. So it does that through haptoglobin. So two kinds of haplogobin, haplogobin 1, haplogobin 2, and people are that either homozygous or heterozygous to haplogobins. So it turns out that zonulin is the precursor for haplogobin 2. And it turns out, look at this, uh, all these various species here, only homo sapiens produce haplogobin 2. So it turns out only homo sapiens release zonulin, and only homo sapiens have problems with wheat. Not a problem for monkeys, not a problem for any other species. Okay, so then we start looking at well, what portion of the population have to level 1-1, which means most likely those are not going to react to wheat, 
from Angwin, of course, the population up to around 2 2, which means they produce a lot more than the US population, but 20% of the population is half 1 1. And in terms of percent of uh, patients with celiac disease, very, very, very small portion of patients with celiac disease are half 1 1. Okay? Now, half 2 2 is 35% of the population, and look at this over half the patients with celiac disease are half 2 2. Then we have half 1 2 we we'll have intermediate amount of release of zygote. So what's going on here? Basically, people here, <coughs> one, two, one, two, 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 the more wheat they eat, the more information you have in the body, regardless of everything else at that time. Those other things, uh, as Dr. Sethi mentioned, that are really important, like what kind of bacteria in your gut, how well you should be hypoglycemic acid, et cetera, et cetera, those have an effect. But bottom line is, more, more zygote, more information you eat wheat, and it's dose dependent. So it turns out that we eat the wheat and you produce zymolin, the gut opens up for a period of time, but then it closes back down after about after minutes to an hour. And unless you have to go over type 2 2, when it opens up, it stays open for hours afterwards. So now let's look at the standard American diet. How often do people eat wheat? <laughs> Cereal for breakfast, coffee, donut for mid morning break, sandwich for lunch, cookies and, and uh, Coca Cola for mid afternoon break. Uh, pasta for dinner and cake for dessert. <laughs> so, what do you think? How 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 often? Do you, what percentage of the time then do you think that guy is over? All the time. <coughs> Chronic upregulation information. <coughs> so, um, just uh, <coughs> Dr. Sutherland like covered this. Okay. So, the zone release is not the only problem with the gliadin. So, this is showing the various uh, aspects of uh, what gliadin does in the body. So not just cause release of, of zymolin, but also upregulates inflammation, has cell side toxic effects, and also has endorphin-like activity, which is one reason why it's so addictive in the body. Okay. So mechanisms for damage, there's a lot of different mechanisms for damage. Um, but one of them is that, and this is very important, is not only are we upregulating inflammation in the body, but we're losing control over what it's getting into the body. So as Dr. Sudley said, remember we have 10 times as many cells in our gut, i.e. bacteria in our gut, as the cells in the body. So I'll say it again, 10 times as many bacteria in the gut as cells in the body, and they're metabolically active and immunologically active. So when the gut is open all the time, not only the food proteins come in, but so are the bacteria. So significant problem. So um, let me just give a few things. So what diseases are associated with elevated levels of zyanide in your blood? Look at this. Look at all your autoimmune diseases, ankylosing spondylitis. So I see patients with ankylosing spondylitis. Which, they, as you know, conventionally is quote an incurable disease. You give them lots of anti inflammatories and they're stopping before it's too much damage to the spine. I haven't stopped eating wheat. Ankylosis spondylitis goes away. Asthma, CI disease, inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, multiple arthritis, SLE, type 1 diabetes. I've had patients in all these categories get better by simply stopping eating wheat. Now, when I say stop eating wheat, realize I'm not, I'm, that's not the only thing I'm doing, of course. I'm improving my di digestion, how to eat properly, recognize nutrition deficiencies, restoring the nutritional status, the environmental toxin exposure, help get rid of environmental toxins. Now, I'm treating the whole person, okay? But the foundation, the foundation is getting the al allergy or in, in, you know, food intolerances are taken care of. So we look at the nervous system, cancers. Look at all these cancers, breast cancer. One out of nine women can get breast cancer. What portion is that, is that simply because of eating wheat? What kind of effect can that have? So, yes. quick question for you. Um, how do you resolve the, the fact that zymolin could be released in the bloodstream as a result of damage to the, to the gut? I mean, like, you know, which causes which? Is it, is it the zymolin right, so that causes? My, my, suspect, my, I suspect that there's other <laughs> organisms that cause the release of zymolin, not just, not just the color. Okay, so probably those do as well. So people have the improper balance of bacteria in the gut there may be a uh, cause of the release there as well. Oh. But right now, in terms of food, it's wheat, rye, and barley. Those are the three. Okay, and my question is just meant like, if, if a person has, say, has an inflammatory state, how do you know that the inflammatory state that's causing the damage in the gut is what's releasing the zygote or not? Like, how do you resolve that? Well, I, I think that's a good question. Uh, because when a person does that inflammation going on the gut, independent of zygote and independent of uh, food reactions, once you have inflammation going on the gut, the gut has to increase permeability. So that's happening all, all day. So, but you're asking the right kind of questions. There's no simplistic answer. You have to look at everything that's going on with the patient. Now, this is scary. This is the really scary part. This is really early research. 
I don't know it's gluten yet, but again, it's been so consistent with what I've seen. And that is, when I've been taking people off wheat, I also took them off dairy products. Because I found they all got better. And again, why was that happening? They didn't have immunological reaction to dairy products. Well, it turned out that the same immunological reaction that happens to wheat cross reacts with other food proteins, including dairy products. So um, you've got to look at everything, not just wheat. Okay. So prevention. Interestingly, um, if you introduce wheat in small amounts to people rather than large amounts, so babies who get small amounts of wheat early on, rather than large amounts, don't seem to get as much C-like disease later on in life, even when they have a genetic predisposition and HLA and the uh, heptoglobin type. Um, if they, um, if, if we if milk, dairy, if dairy products are introduced at the same <coughs> time as wheat, they're more likely to get uh, the reaction to the wheat than if they are introduced separately. A healthy bacteria, uh, we think about the right kind of bacteria we got, they have less reactivity to the wheat, even if they have celiac mm -hmm. disease. Uh, if they have good digestion, they have less uh, reaction to the wheat because the wheat proteins are broken down to the amino acids more effectively. So people who are hypo or hypohydrate have much increased incidence of celiac disease. If people are low in pancreatic enzyme secretion, such as people with diabetes. You think of diabetes, both type 1 and type 2, as a decreased amount of insulin that's available. That is true. Okay? But they also have a decreased amount of digestive pancreatic enzymes being secreted. And as you might expect, it's much lower in people with type 1 diabetes than type 2, because type 1 diabetes, which of course, as you know, in the pancreas has been damaged by the autoimmune inflammatory infectious reaction, whatever it was that caused the beta cells to go right down. Okay. So, just there's data too that if you're born vaginally rather than C-section, that you have decreased risk, so that's also. Yes, and if you're, if you're raised on a farm or in the city, you have decreased risk. So, recommendations. So, I put this all together to say, now what do I tell people about this? <coughs> and um, I put together this list. And basically what I looked at is the proportion of population that this affects and how to determine the effect on them and what to do about it. So basically, if you have to go with type 1 1, and because of other reasons, have not developed uh, antibodies to wheat, then wheat is okay for you. And that looks like about one third of the population. One third of the population can eat wheat without, without trouble. About 40% of the population is going to have a dose-dependent reaction to wheat. And that is, while they may not have celiac disease, uh, the more wheat they eat, the more trouble they're going to have. So when I now, whenever I talk to anybody who has any kind of health problem, I say, the first thing you do is stop eating wheat for two months and come back and talk to me again. It's amazing how many don't need to talk to me again. Then we have some people who have antibodies to uh, wheat protein, particularly glycogen. Okay, so independent of half the golden type, they already have antibodies to wheat most likely that's problematic for them. It turns out that about one out of six people in the general population has antibodies to wheat for whatever reason. So as the nice list of put Dr. Sethi, so it showed you all the uh, different kinds of antibody tests that can be run. Now about one out of six people has, has that reaction. Celiac disease, although the research literature says one half to one percent, I would assert it's probably close to three percent, which is way under diagnosed. Now that's just me look at the research, pull a number out of the, out of the air, I may be wrong, but I think it's actually way underdiagnosed. And in five autoimmune disease, about five percent of people uh, are going to have autoimmune disease. Anybody with autoimmune disease should not be taking wheat. So basically, um, I'll quote Dr. Fasano to finish this up, and he says basically, quote, once gluten is removed from the diet, serum dining levels decrease, the intestine resumes its ba uh, baseline barrier function, the autoantibody titers are normalized, the autoimmune reaction process shuts down, and consequently, the in intestinal damage that represents the biological outcome of autoimmune reactions uh, heals completely. And I just want to say that he made that quote in 19, oh, it came out like three or four years ago. Um, I haven't seen that for four years. It's, it's remarkable how bad wheat is for the majority of the population. So thank you for kind of, kind of attention. Now let's have a, let's have a dialogue before that. Um, let me pass you I actually wrote, a, I'm, I'm the editor of this uh, journal called Integrated Medicine. I actually wrote an editorial that just covers what I just said in more detail. I think the best editorial I've been in 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you have to be self-reflective. You know, some, some of my articles were, you know, I had to, get, had to meet a deadline. <laughs> <laughs> Other articles are really good, and I think they're good. Uh, and these can stay here if you want. And this, uh, this is my uh, latest textbook. It's called um, Clinical Pathology. <coughs> a functional perspective. 
This is a book I wish I had when I was a student in your issue. Because way back four years ago when I was a student learning basic sciences, I was saying, how do you apply the basic sciences to clinical application? Because that's what that's what neopathic doctors do very well, that's what integrated medicine doctors do well, that's something which conventional medical doctors seem to have forgotten. I'm glad to be critical about you guys, I'm sorry about this. You have great basic sciences training, and then we get to the clinic, you seem to forget. Read this book, you won't forget. So you guys are starting to Zonulin, 
If there's other antibodies to the wheat, they may be reacting to those as well. So for my patient, what I do is I just have them be extremely strict, get everything healed up, then we re challenge them with things and see what happens. So I, I, I have a question for you folks. How many of you, I'm gonna ask four questions. Are you an ND student, ND student? Are you an MD or an ND as practitioner, or are you undefined? <laughs> okay, so how many are, are ND students? How many are your bad? How many are your bad year students? Okay. <laughs> okay, how many of your MD students? You're going to watch medical school students. Great, good to see you. How many of your naturopathic doctors? Naturopathic doctors. How many of your medical doctors? Great. And how many of you are in some other category? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, this is a big question. Do I have a uh, preference on my DHA source? So I'm a, I'm a great believer in natural health products. I'm also very cognizant of challenges with quality for natural health products. So if I have a patient with autoimmune disease, I'm having a compounding pharmacist make it up for me. So I know I know it's good quality, and I get the doses exactly right. So Key Pharmacy down in, uh, in uh, Federal Way is the one I use. They, they're very, very good. And there's, there's a lot more things we can do. We're just scratching the surface. Are you testing a lot of your patients or all your patients for the Captain um, Newman? I have not started doing that because I just learned it. Okay. How about have you? Are you doing that? <coughs> so, the, so are the decisions made then based on whether or not, I mean, then how do you make the decision of whether or not it's okay to drink, eat meat or eat wheat or not? So one of my jobs as a journal editor is to look to the future and say, people should start doing these tests. So I'm not in clinical practice anymore, but I'm now saying, get a patient with chronic disease, check your happy blood type. So, and my population is quite underserved, and so there, there's probably no way I'm ever gonna be able to do these tests, but um, a lot of it can be done empirically by taking the weed out and seeing what happens. So um, I use elimination diets uh, faithfully, because it's Okay, here, here's some discourse. So how do you do elimination diets? <laughs> I have people take out, yeah, there's lots of different ways. So I um, have people take out the most um, the sort of high offending uh, foods, which are gluten, soy, eggs, corn, citrus, um, dairy, thank you. And refined sugars, alcohol, and caffeine. And I have them do that for two to three weeks, and then we challenge them in one at a time. Do you want to make? One every three days. One every three days. And what do you have them watch for? So really broad. I have them just be really mindful. Because I have people come in with saying, like, what I'm, what I'm trying to get rid of is X. But then when they do their challenges, they realize that there were other symptoms they didn't really feel like they needed to tell me about, like allergies or congestion or pain in their joints or whatever it is. And so I have them be really mindful just to keep a diary about what they're feeling when they do that. Great. How do you do it? Okay, so um, <laughs> this, is, this is not a trivial question because this, this is a challenge. So there's two basic ways of doing it. One is by doing lab tests for antibodies, and the other is by doing challenge testing in one form or another. They each have an advantage and disadvantage. The advantage of the lab test is that you have something that's objective and gives you good information. The disadvantage is that it's expensive and it doesn't get everything, and if it's for example, having a non immunological reaction, uh, it's not going to pick that up either. So I did that, a lot of that early on in my, in my practice, and I just gave up on it. Too expensive, wasn't being clinically relevant enough. So what I do is, I, again, remember, I'm an naturopathic doctor. I'm a little more extreme. Patients come to me are kind of expecting that. But here's what I do. Put them on a four-day water fast. Okay, now before you freak out and say, hi, put me on a four-day water fast, don't they die? <laughs> <laughs> now, so, so think about us as a species as we evolve. Do we have food available to us all the time? No. no. Okay. We have great mechanisms for being on a water fast. So something I tell my best students, how many of you best students have had my, my healing systems class so far? Okay, so I'll well, only just a few of you so far. Okay, so you have to look forward to that next in the springtime. Um, what I tell my patients is what old Dr. Carroll used to say to me. He said, before you try a therapy patient, try it on the dog first. 
Right? That was his way of saying, do it yourself before you have a patient do it. Okay, so put patient on a four-day water fast. fast. I've done juice fast, I've done vegetable juice fast, I've done uh, broth fast, all these kinds of fasts. I'll tell you right quick, water fast is the easiest fast to do. It's the scariest, but the easiest fast to do. Put them on a four-day water fast, and keep it a symptom diary. Now in general, all the symptoms are not going to go away in four days, but they will get somewhat better by the fourth day. Now the fifth day, I had to eat a low allergy food, so I start getting some calories into it. So I had to get like, one of my favorites is avocados. Avocados are very rare and allergic, and they have a fair amount of calories with them. So on the, that's on the odd day, it's safe food. And then on the even day, I'll then give them a problematic food. So I'll give them something like, I'll just start with wheat. I'll say eat wheat, eat the wheat in the way you normally eat it, several times during the day, watch your symptoms, and in particular, watch how you wake up the next morning. So I alternate days. Safe food, allergenic food, safe food, allergenic food. Now you can do the allergenic food the first day if you want to, the safe food the second day, but there's various ways to do it, okay? And I basically I'm do for about two weeks, and I go through all the major food categories. Now the big advantage of this methodology is that in general, when you say to a patient, I think you have food allergies, invariably they'll say, oh, I know it's not X, because every time you eat X, I feel better. That's the worst food allergy. So you're going to tell the person to stop eating their favorite food. Do you think they're going to be more responsive to that? No, okay. But what happens is, they go through four-day water fast, they now eat this food, all of a sudden they feel, oh, God, look what happened to them. Because everything, eczema gets worse, asthma, sorry, asthma attacks, they have a lot of allergies, nasal congestion, it all gets worse. They start making a psychological connection between what happened to them eating that food, and now it's easier to stop eating the food. Now you say, well, how about children? Children aren't going to stop eating foods they're allergic to. And what I find is kids are a lot easier to change their foods than it is for adults. Because, you know, adults already have this pattern built in. So what I do with the kid is I don't do it with the parent. I do it with the kid. And as I say to the kid, okay, you got the asthma. You don't like it, right? No, I don't like the asthma. So look what's happened to you when you eat in the dairy pots. And, it, and I say, so it's your, it's your, it's your life, you, you decide. <laughs> <laughs> so so what the kids do, they use that as power over their parents. Now if you said to the parent, don't have the child in the dairy pots, now it's a fight between the parent and the child. Now the child has control, and the child has control of the parent. Kids really like it. <laughs> so I find it much easier to get kids to stop eating food, eating the foods they're allergic to, but you, you have to make a connection with yeah, um, I was just curious about the intervention with probiotics, and um, well, we actually had someone investor this week talk about it, and Nigel Plummer came and talked to us about probiotics, and um, I was just curious if it's contraindicated for the autoimmune disease, or why you left that out of the intervention in the other categories besides the. I'm just doing shorthand for what I can squeeze into. But it's appropriate for all of them. And virtually the whole part, yeah. particular strains of bacteria that are better? Yeah, now we're getting to some complex territory. You I'd love to hear your answer to this as well. Mm -hmm. um, there are about 600 known strains of bacteria that the average person's got. And we're not sure which is the right ones, which are the bad ones. So what I try to do is I give people a broad spectrum of what are thought to be healthy, healthy gut bacteria, and it's really hard to change some of the uh, microbial flora. So I've tried to get rid of bad bacteria using antibiotics if necessary, or antibiotics if appropriate, or whatever. And then I use the, uh, the broad spectrum uh, of Yeah, I would agree with that. And I, I would just add that I, um, I try to explain to people that the way that these bacteria you know, grew is first how you ate, how you fed your bacteria. So giving them a broad spectrum probiotic, but then also explaining that try to eat the right kind of food for the right kind of bacteria. So kind of going back to food as medicine always. So I'll, I'll give you an example of how important this is. One of my employees, his 18-year-old um, daughter, has had severe ulcerative colitis now for several years. And typical drug approach and such, not particularly effective. Uh, she used some of the recommendations I made my effective natural medicine, some improvement, but not very much. And then decided to do the uh, inoculation route. So she inoculated herself with her father's poop. And she said, my gas starts smelling like my dad's, not my own. <laughs> and three months later, 
no osteoarthritis. It was all because she had the wrong bacteria in her gut. Now she's also, in the context of doing a lot of things right, because I was telling her to do it right, but until she changed her bacteria, she didn't get rid of the osteoarthritis. Tell you to go out and start fasting people and let you know what you're doing. Seriously. Because there are contraindications for fasting. Uh, there, there's modifications we make uh, based on what's wrong with the person. So this is not a trivial thing to do. And I also will say that it's more difficult to fast people now than it was uh, in 1975 when I first started in private practice. Because our, our world is more toxic. Which means when people start fasting, there's a lot more toxins coming out. So it's a more complex world to live in. What you'll find is the vast majority of people with autoimmune disease have very low DHA levels. And whether that's in response to or contributing to or the condition is unclear. But about 50%, look at some of the rheumatoid arthritis, 50% lower than some of the other rheumatoid arthritis. So it turns out DHA is really helpful. Even after you break quite well, you don't people a So I'll come back. I'm just wondering about um, patient compliance and whether it's the type of patients that you're clinic selects for, but I feel like um, a lot of people have problems just getting patients to restrict calories, let alone go on this type of kind of very restrictive um, elimination diets, and how much success you have with people being compliant for that. Those fall back to that. I would say, I mean, there's a variability in how much, uh, how much, uh, I wouldn't say convincing, how much information and um, <coughs> sort of absorption it takes for people, but I see a wide, diverse cultural and socioeconomic population that's um, not going to, I mean, if, if you think, if you're thinking about selecting for a naturopath's office or, um, but they are very willing. I mean, people are in a lot of suffering, you know, they're in a lot of pain, they're having a lot of dysfunction, they're, they want to try something and they want to stop taking these toxic medications. So people, I have a lot of success in getting people to do it. And, I don't, I don't do the fast, actually, but, um, but I mean, the elimination diet in of itself is quite restrictive when you look at it. But um, I get people do it all the time, every day, a lot of success. And that, that, I think that's exactly the same amount I would give. And that is, to some, first off, we have an advantage, both in meat medicine, integrated medicine, that if people are choosing to come to us, they know that something different is going to happen. That's an advantage. And the other part is, uh, in our meat training, we give our students a lot of training in how you engage people with behavioral change. It's not easy. That was a hard to change. So, yes, I'm not going to be patient, so I'm going to respond. And so I tell my students is, your job is not to be authoritarian and only have one way. Your job is to work with that patient to see what it is they are going to be able to do. And maybe it's only this much and you need to do this much, but get them to do that much. And they get some improvement, and then we'll do that much. You get them on a pathway. Make, Naturopathic doctor. What is it? It's nature's path. <laughs> I also, um, I think that once you explain to people that, um, at least this is my clinical experience, is that if you're trying to get from where you are to here, it's very hard, I think, and it's just hard for us as humans to get here by cutting back a little and cutting back this. And sometimes when you go drastic, it's easier to come back to some middle that's maybe around here. And um, I see that every day, and so I think people are really, they get that, that it's just sometimes they need to do something <coughs> a little bigger than what they were thinking. Um, so back to the question of diagnosing, I'm especially interested in that non-celiac food sensitivity group and that number 43%. So I've heard even um, naturopathic doctors who in the community who are kind of skeptical about that group and the whole idea of the sensitivity because there are no, there is no true immune reaction and no lab tests. And that even when you do the elimination diet, you know, people say, oh, I felt so much better when I cut out meat. But then, you know, the way they're eating 
and then when they reintroduce, it's <laughs> usually in processed, highly refined, um, very sugar calorie laden foods. And so it's you know, is it a true food sensitivity, and how can yeah, that, I think that's an excellent observation. And, and let me expand on it a little bit. So realize that while we take people off the wheat, no matter said we do other things as well, we put them on a healthier diet. So it could be simply we just got them off wheat, and wheat has with it all these calories and sugar and you know, added to food additives, et cetera. Maybe it's just that we put them on a healthier diet. And I think that's really, really important. So there's this old adage back that uh, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> so, if you have a, I, I tell the students about this, read the old timers, read the, read the data of the doctors writing 100 years ago, great clinical insights, but they tend to make two mistakes. One is they get a great clinical insight and they say, oh, this cures the whole world. Well, no such thing. Okay? The second thing is that they were limited by the physiology understanding of the time, so their explanation for the mechanism of action is probably not accurate because the physiologist was not the time. But they had a good clinical insight. Recognize one insight by itself is not the other thing. So I'm going to tell you very clearly, getting people off wheat dramatically improves health. But it could simply be not because of the zonal connection, it could be simply because they're eating, they're more conscious of their health, they're eating better, better, they're exercising more, reducing the stress, other things may be happening as well. So you always have to consider those things. So I feel like you're going to add anything there? I just, I just look if they get better, I'm happy. So um, some of my research friends told me that the uh, celiac or the gluten intolerance is primarily happening to um, Caucasians. Rarely see any case in Asians. Do you find that true in your practice? The Asian population has slightly more one one than the Caucasian population. But other, other than that, I've seen Cauca uh, Asians have weak problems. Well. I mean, you wonder if it's less wheat products being More like even less. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, has there been any research showing that it's the GMO wheat product that might be causing the blood pressure <coughs> reactions in the gut versus, I mean, I know it's hard to avoid GMO wheat and stuff, but has there been any research where people eat food that might not have been a lot of times or by the end of the year that would have the same reaction as GMO? So there, there's two answers to that. One is, if you look at the amount of gliadin in wheat now as compared to when we first started cultivating it you know, thousands of years ago, uh, it's about twice as much gliadin now as before. So if, you're, so if you're eating something like Cameroon, any of the quote, ancient wheats, if you have celiac disease, you will react to ancient wheat just as much as you respond to react to current wheat. However, if you have to go on one, two, and don't have the antibodies, then you can eat twice, eat twice as much of that wheat to get the same reaction as modern wheat. I know it's a little bigger question than you're asking. In terms of GMO, all those epi epidemiological uh, correlations between wheat consumption and chronic disease all happened before GMOs uh, came out. My assumption is that, that GMO is going to change the game, but I don't know in what way. Okay, your turn. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on dairy, have, if you look at the difference between I know that some people believe there's a difference. Every time I looked at the research literature, I could not find documentation. But having said that, of course, when you pasteurize, you're going to do, you're, going to, you're changing the, the character of the food, so I would expect it to be different. But I, I couldn't find any hard data. Have you noticed the difference between um, taking soy Hippocrates, let your food be your medicine, your medicine, your foods. Um, my preference always is food first, but to get things started, I freely use supplements. I would say we just don't really know how to compare, you know, when you want to do medicinal dosing, it's really hard to know how much is in those, but I would just the same way just recommend those fermented foods as well. But it's really hard to say that you're getting this much in. Can you comment on some of the research efforts that the naturopathic community is taking 
uh, towards testing some of these hypotheses, of, of you know whether or not HP12 uh, is associated with higher wheat tolerance, or you know, what kind of framework is set up for that uh, to start helping to change some of the other medical disciplines if there is an effect. Um, right now, this all comes from the conventional medical community. I'm not aware of any naturopathic doctors doing this particular research. I hope somebody does it. So I, we're, we're, you might say we're a research using community more than we are a research producing community. Okay. Okay. Okay.
like I said, I don't think the information about it would all make it relevant because the truth is that the information, okay, this is going to sound political, it is. But, um, sorry, I just don't know how to get out of it with that question. The, the information you're getting is highly, highly, highly influenced by pharmaceutical companies and they want you to use medications at every step of the way and so that's what you're learning. But the truth is that's not the only thing to do. So I don't, that's it, I'm going to stop my talk. <laughs> You mean for, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just a lot of influence and a lot of um, hands in the pot, and they want you to do what they want you to do. And I would just read every study with skepticism and openness. <coughs> and I would um, think a little bit about when you see patients, think about what could promote health. I mean, the problem with medical school, the good thing about medical school is all the information you get, and it's great. And the problem is that what we're taught is to give people drugs. And what I do now is look at people and think first, the very first thing I think is what can I remove that are barriers to health? And then I think what can I put in that can help the body heal? That's very different than what I was taught. I want to say, that is exactly what I was taught. Wave my magic wand, every day I come to the doctor, we have one year required residency. 
we need that for part of residency. But the problem is there's political stuff. The end needs to have all the money we don't. So we can't afford the, the residency. If we had the money, I'd have everybody do residency. But one of the disadvantages of going to make better ground, and that is we have to um, take more challenging pathways. <laughs> I just want to, in general, thank whoever put this together because I know at Best Year we're really interested in integrative medicine and, and doing best practice medicine, um, family practice in particular. Um, and so it's, we're in the same city, sort of, we're in Kenmore. And so just kind of a open welcome. Um, we have really cool talks up at, at our campus. It's very beautiful. You can see in Edwards Park, you can take a hike down to the the water, you can come mushroom hunting with us. So, like, <laughs> um, but um, so just thank you for putting an integrated talk together. Maybe we can do it on our campus next time and um, keep this going and make connections now because together we can really change what what the healthcare system looks like in the future. Thank you all.